American poet Dorothy Parker once said, London is satisfied, Paris is resigned, but New York is always hopeful. But after the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of people are asking, is New York officially dead? Or is she on the verge of making one of her greatest comebacks? New York City alone now accounts for about a quarter of all confirmed coronavirus cases. For the millions of small businesses now shut down. Nearly one out of every three New Yorkers was out of work. How do you make sure that post-pandemic, they want to come back? Pandemic or not, New Yorkers fill the streets with an electrifying energy that you won't find anywhere else. But is this vibrancy strong enough to keep the city afloat? Well, who better to ask than workers who've remained resilient through an unparalleled decline in the city's leading industries, including live theater, nightlife, and luxury real estate. You got your start on Million Dollar Listing. How'd that come about? A uh, Million Dollar Listing came about somewhere around 2016, 2017, but I was in real estate almost in 2008 when Bear Stearns crashed. You gotta say, this past year during the pandemic, that must have been a pretty wild time to be in the real estate market, right? It was wild. In New York City, we were in the epicenter yeah. of COVID. The news was parks being empty, people fleeing the city, going to the suburbs, going to here, there, everywhere. Mm -hmm. What do you see for the future of real estate here in New York. It's actually just getting started again and coming back in a bigger way, I think, than ever. There's this vibrancy, the culture, the creativity. Just as quickly as everyone left, they're all coming back at the same time, too. Well, Rob, you're home. I'm finally back home. It's been almost 17 months since I left Times Square, long overdue. You have many credits to your name, uh, Beetlejuice. Yeah. You were nominated for a Tony for Chaplin as well, That's correct? right, yeah. And right before the pandemic, you landed a very iconic role as Mrs. Doubtfire. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. That's one of the most iconic movies played by one of the most legendary actors of our time, Robin Williams. Hello! What's it like as an actor to fill those shoes? I never will, because he's a genius. But if I can make the audience feel the way his performance made me feel, I'll consider that a success. Shutting down for COVID probably wasn't a nice reprieve. No, and I think audiences feel the same way. I keep on thinking about the first night we come back and everyone comes in and sits down and there's that moment when the house lights go halfway out and overture starts. That energy is going to be crazy. Yeah. I can't you, wait. You nervous? Yes! If you're not nervous, you don't understand how lucky you are to be where you mm -hmm. are. Of all the fabulous spots in Manhattan, why the Winter Garden at Brookfield Place? This, I mean, look at it. First of all, it's beautiful. There's shopping, there's vibrance, there's life, and it reflects a lot of the things I love about the city. I couldn't have chosen a better place for our first date. I'm so this happy. Place is so romantic. You recently appeared in a music video inspired by Billy Joel's New York State of Mind. I had no idea who else was gonna be in it. Stephen Colbert, right? Ad Adina Menzel. I mean, so many of my favorites. I mean, I know a lot of people know me from doing Drag Race. And mm -hmm. I was actually in Canada filming a brand new drag competition show. And I got a call from Tom Kitt, who is like the music director for half of Broadway. And he was like, look, we're coming back. The shows are starting to reopen. And we want to let people know that we're here. So it was just a wonderful love letter to the city mm -hmm. to tell people most of us never went anywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, we still have a lot to offer. And that's what it is. When I leave New York City and I come back and there's just driving in, there's like a vibration. There is. That you can feel. It pulses. No, this city does. like pulsates. There is something about the living, breathing movement of this area. The streets are the are the veins, and the avenues are the arteries. The cement is the cracking skin. And, and Times Square is the armpit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Depends how close you are to the naked cowboy. <laughs> I mean, this is where the heartbeat of, of American musical theater is. And there's something about the proximity to the makers of the art 
that I think everyone can feel. You could go to a restaurant and you could be sitting with an artist, a financial wizard, a real estate a mogul, real estate <laughs> mogul. But yeah, I mean, people are addicted to it. They keep coming back, they are coming back. And now the market is speaking for it. I mean, we sold that penthouse, see the top there? Sold that penthouse this year. See that Jenga building there? That penthouse just sold just under 50 million last week. New Yorkers are not, they don't care what you say. You know, when there were th articles or people going like, is New York City dead? We laugh, especially theater people. Yeah. Theater people are scrappy. If you are in New York and you are in a part of nightlife or queer nightlife, you have a thicker skin than I think most people would expect. You can't keep a good queen down. No, Peppermint, as a singer songwriter, Yes! If you oh. were going to write your own love letter to the city, what would it be called? I don't know, can you help me out here? Okay, just hear me out. Okay. You can't drag me out, bitch. <laughs> yeah. That's right, honey. You can't drag me out, bitch! <laughs> So this park here, Little Island, is a recent addition to the New York City skyline, right? Yeah, all the piers along the riverfront here are ultimately getting developed into some sort of green spaces, communal spaces, which the city needs. really, really needs. Really I mean, needs. The world has changed so much in the last 17 months that Broadway has to change with it. And as much as we are all tending to say, Broadway's back, Broadway's back, Broadway's back, what we actually hope to mean is that Broadway's moving forward. Nightlife is definitely going to be different. I mean, you know, more people are certainly washing their hands than ever have before, and I, that ain't never Ooh, been a bad thing. Not me. You just touched me. You got exposed to the banana variant. Oh, I think I had that before. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> How can you look at this and say, Buddy, this is going to die? Your guess is as good as mine, man. There's no place like yeah. it. Yeah, no, there really, really isn't. isn't. Mrs. Delphire has a really great monologue at the end of the show. She ends by saying, all my love, puppet you're going to be all right. And the notion of turning out to a New York City audience after what we've all been through, and as Mrs. Doubtfire saying, you're going to be all right. Oh, my love, puppet. That's right. You're going? You're going? To be? To be? All right. All right. Ah, boy. Like any great city, New York is known for her diverse cuisine and world-class eateries. And despite many businesses shutting down during the pandemic, restaurants are popping up all over the city from both veteran chefs and first-time restaurateurs, including Brooklyn's Kokomo Restaurant. Oh my God. And the West Village's Les Trois Chevaux. Well, first of all, thank you for wearing the tie. Hey. I know this is like not totally normal for you, but what do you mean? thank you. <laughs> I'm a student tie guy. While Le Trois Chevaux is your newest establishment, mm -hmm. you are, I guess, more famously known for the Beatrice Inn, which was right next door to here, yeah. that unfortunately had the closed its doors. I had the Beatrice for eight years, and you know, it's always such an honor to own something that is iconic to the city of New York. But as a creative, we have to keep on evolving. And for me, the act of dining, it really is about the environment. I want diners to come in and sit here in this beautiful banquette and sit under the original chandelier from the Waldorf Astoria. It was time to bring the city back that I remember from 20 years ago, the mm -hmm. city that I fell in love with, which is what Le Trois Chevaux is. What was the inspiration behind, behind Kokomo? We actually met in a restaurant that I used to work at. It was a Caribbean restaurant, and he was a guest chef there. We fell in love really quick, got married in under eight months. You work fast, my friend. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it made sense for us to just open up our own establishment and make it Caribbean and let it explore the love for each other as well as the love for the islands that we have. What a beautiful story. You're both first-time restaurateurs. Yeah. Yes. Not only did we open a restaurant in the pandemic, Rhea was pregnant. We had one child already. And um, just her enduring through that inspired me <laughs> as a man to, like, you know, to work harder yeah. and to be better. It literally hit probably three weeks before we were about to open. So at that point, we had invested everything oh, into yeah, it. Yeah, that's scary. It was scary as hell. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Opening this place once COVID hit. 
Was there a fear inside? Did you feel like there was a risk? You know, I think Eleanor Roosevelt said it best when she said, well-behaved women rarely make history. No risk, no reward. Yeah, exactly. What we did was document the whole entire experience mm -hmm. via our social media, mm -hmm. and we got a lot of love and support from that. That's awesome. And as soon as we got the green light to do outdoor dining, Good like pack. this whole entire sidewalk was flooded. This sidewalk and that sidewalk. Flooded with people. The people that really understood the soul of the Beatrice very much understand the soul of the Toshavo. To have them still come here excited for the new things that we're doing, that has been one of the most amazing things. Tell me about these uh, fabulous plates we have in front of us. <laughs> well, this is terrine de canard. It's duck breast encased in foie gras, encased in a uh, lillet rosé, candied caracara, and kumquats. And just when I thought I was the tastiest snack at this table. Well, I was sitting here first, so. That's true. Yeah. Part of what I love about, like, the old oh. school restaurant. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's like a flavor explosion. That is, that's something else. I didn't expect that. Wow. You know they say there's plenty more fish in the sea? Yeah. Not anymore. Not anymore. And we're not skimpy on the portions either. No, so. man. The star of the flatbread is the ackee, which is the national fruit of Jamaica. It's something I grew up eating. You know, my mom made that like every Saturday and Sunday for breakfast. And to pay homage to New York, of course, it's a New York style crust. It tastes like heaven. <laughs> <laughs> Papadel pasta, jerk chicken. Go to Chong wings. You just gotta dig in. Let me try that pigeon. So I'm French trained, but one of the things that was really important to me is to incorporate a lot of ingredients from Asia. So we actually take the breast of pigeon and wrap it in sakura leaves from the cherry trees in spring. I get them imported from Japan. Wow. And then bury it in ash. That's incredible. I'm never gonna look at a pigeon the same. Yeah, you love it now, don't you? I love them. There seems to be this popular notion going around that New York is dead. Do you agree with that? Absolutely not. The city has always been about literature and art and cuisine, and the creatives are the ones that have stayed here. You know, we just roll up our sleeves and we just get on with it. No matter if you're the dishwasher at a restaurant or you're working for a Fortune 500 company, everybody gets up with a purpose here. Like, we're just a hungry group of people. Yeah. Here's to New York. Hey, here's to New cheers, Yorkers, cheers, man, cheers. being the, 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 the strongest ones out there, cheers, right? And to Brooklynites. Hey, yes. and to Brooklynites. <laughs> I'm from the Bronx. Huh? <laughs> All right, I'm from California. <laughs> Salud. Salud. Not only have people come back to the city, you got robots rolling around. What I love about New York City, you can go from one side of the city to the other in a matter of minutes. There's multiple ways to get there. And every one of New York City's neighborhoods and boroughs has its own unique identity and something completely different to offer. But one thing New Yorkers have in common is having strong opinions. And there's definitely mixed feelings from those who stayed through the pandemic about the people who left when things got tough. But in Brooklyn, an underground art collective founded by Samara Bliss took this debate to a whole new level while revealing the importance of investing in the city's new wave of artists. Thank you for uh, welcoming me into the locker room here. You're welcome, great to have you. This doesn't resemble a locker room I've ever been in. It smells a lot better too. <laughs> It was first inspired by watching two movies that had sort of iconic locker room scenes in them, The Joker and Hustlers. In cinema, it's like such a great tool because it's sort of this safe place where the character can say things that he wouldn't normally otherwise. Mm -hmm. It's like such a great tool for changing. I was an event producer for about five years. When that stopped and the pandemic started, I realized now is the time to spend my entire life savings on what I've always wanted to do, which is build a multifaceted space that is a recording studio and an artist studio and a gallery. All of the above. All of the above. Wow. When tragedy strikes, you know, there's terrible parts about it, but then there's also things that get born out of the rubble. I wanted to birth something out of rubble. <laughs> 
during phase two in New York, and I sort of noticed that there's this whole vortex of artists who were still here and had all this energy and were feeling really inspired by everything that was transpiring and needed a place to go. We said, let's choose 10 artists and did a lockdown at the locker room. Samara had approached me. She asked me if I wanted to be part of the residency. Mm -hmm. She said, uh, free paste to paint. Free supplies, I said, sign me up, let's go. The synergy was amazing. We call it, what do we call that? Flow a tree. We call it flow a tree. I like that. Yeah, I like that. It was amazing. I was able to like pick up different things that these artists do. Like, I normally use spray paint and then acrylic paint, then let me try to do what Jasper does and do some mixed mediums. And there's a lot of room for error and to try new things and to experiment and to like really be confident in what it is you want to do. It really relieves a lot of the weight. So it's almost like when the pandemic hit, it was like life as we knew it changed, right? You were able to also redefine and break down the boundaries of who you were as an artist. You know, you would just come here and you knew that you had a space where you could be free. In a way it was necessary, you know, as a survival tool, showing that you were alive and that your art wasn't dead. Out of this came an entire album a documentary film that's coming out in the fall, a whole book of photography, and then 95 paintings wow. that came out of this one month. And you know, all of it is, is now for sale. One of the most notable works to come from the locker room amid the pandemic was its New York is Dead installation, displayed high above the streets of LA and beaches of Miami. There was an article in the New York Post and the title of it was New York is Dead. You know, he's decrying sort of the final fall of mm. New York. Jerry Seinfeld retorted back mm. saying, you know, New York could never die. You know, I sort of wanted to add to that messaging. The commentary we were making is not about, you know, the girl who had to move back to Alabama. It's sort of about people who left New York and took their fortunes elsewhere and were spending money to party in Miami. Mm. Part of the New York story is that like, there's always this flux of people who would do anything to be here. Come hell or high water. Yeah. We're in the midst of like a new renaissance. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. yes. I mean, art always brings the cities back and help breathe life back into the city. And I think that's exactly what's happening. And what makes New York unique is the people. You know, you guys riding this pandemic out together finding strength within each other, that really says a lot about the greater city at large. All the forward, never straight. Absolutely. <laughs>
Well, the Phoenix, it's, it's a mythical creature that rises up from the ashes. This roller coaster was built as symbolism to show that New York is rising from the ashes like the Phoenix. Any last words, Sonia? I hate you. <laughs> I hate you. Here we go, Sonia! Here goes a drop! So Sonia, listen, you started the night with one big banana and you're ending the night with two big bananas. And I don't even have to take you home now. You're known for being one of the most famous, amazing, fantastic, glamorous housewives of New York. Do you think the pandemic brought you and your co-stars like even yeah. closer together? Absolutely. I'm very grateful to have them. Man, we went through it together. We love each other more than ever now. If you had to tell New York City and New Yorkers one thing, what would you tell them? We're back bigger than ever, and our youth is gonna go forward. And I'm going into a nursing home after this. I got one foot in the grave and the other in a nursing home. And you know the STDs are really big in there. Well, from the shores to the streets of New York, the future of the city seems clear. Despite the pandemic's catastrophic effects, most New Yorkers are immune from giving up hope. Businesses can close and people can move on, but the love New Yorkers share for their city is something that will never die. I think what's so special about New York, anyone can come here without a dollar in their pocket and make something of themselves. You know, New York doesn't care who you are in like a beautiful way. What's great about the city is the people. New Yorkers have an understanding of the value of the arts in their city and they get it. Anything that you put in front of us, we know that we'll either push through it or we'll overcome it. You know, you're constantly surrounded by the most thought-provoking things. For me, it's the epicenter of the world. For New York, a comeback isn't a question of if, but when. And I'm excited to see what's next for the greatest city on Earth. Hey guys, thanks for watching the video. For more, subscribe to First Look and come with me on all my adventures around the world. Who am I kidding? I'm probably sitting at home watching Netflix or playing Xbox. Either way, what are you waiting for? Just hit subscribe already.